Hi, we're going to have a look at Arjzen's um, The Theory of Planned Behaviour model from 1991. So I'm going to explain each section and relate it to health promotion campaigns. So this picture is the whole model and I'm going to break it down now looking at each different, so if you see it's in different colours, um, I'm going to break it down and look at each colour, each section. So the first thing we're going to look at is the very last uh, green box, the likelihood of behaviour. The model is used to determine how likely someone is to engage in a certain behaviour. Um, it's used by health psychologists, for example, if they are looking at the likelihood of someone giving up smoking, they would use the model to find out how likely that person is to give up. So the likelihood of behaviour is where you start. And it could be anything like the likelihood of somebody giving up smoking, the likelihood of somebody binge drinking. So you can see it's on two different levels. You can either see whether someone's likely to do something healthy, like give up smoking is healthy, or you can see how likely somebody is to do something quite dangerous for their health, like how likely they are to binge drink. And then we're going to look at all the different sections to find out how likely that person is to do that behaviour. So the first section is in yellow, um, and the whole thing is trying to find out somebody's personal attitude. So have a look at that first box, it's called outcome beliefs. Um, so that means what we believe to be the outcome of taking the behaviour. So let's have a look at it in terms of how likely somebody is to give up smoking. So somebody's personal attitude might not be um, correct, but it is what's inside their head. So you would need to find out what's going on inside their head in order to see whether they're likely to give up smoking. So if their outcome belief is that to give up smoking is um, a, a useful for them, then their personal attitude would be favourable to giving up. But their outcome belief might not be. It might be, if I give up smoking, it's going to make me really stressed. So their outcome belief is that um, the outcome of doing that is going to cause them some kind of negativity. The next section is outcome evaluations, the next box down. And that means how worthwhile we consider the outcome of the behaviour. So how worthwhile would it be for me to give up smoking if I was a smoker? Again, it doesn't necessarily have to be true. It might be, they might think, well, I'm really young, it's not really going to affect my health much at the moment because I'm so young, and um, so therefore I'm not going to worry about it. So they would have a negative out evaluation to giving up smoking. Whereas somebody else might think, how worthwhile is it? They might think, well, it'll make me healthy and I'm going to save loads of money, so actually it's a really worthwhile thing to do for me. So you can see that it's very individual. So the outcome beliefs and the outcome evaluations mix together to cause somebody's personal attitude. So they might have a positive personal attitude to giving up smoking, or they might have a negative personal attitude. It depends what their outcome beliefs and outcome evaluations are. The next section of the model, the white section, is called, uh, we're trying to find out somebody's subjective norms. So subjective means your own opinion. You know we often look at things like objective and subjective. Objective is based on fact, and subjective is your own personal opinions. So subjective norms means your personal opinion about what is normal for you. And your subjective norms is made up of two things, your normative beliefs and your motivation to comply. Normative beliefs is just very simple. It means all the things that you're told by different people. So you might be told by school teachers, for example, um, smoking's bad for you. But you might be told by other people like friends, smoking's really cool, smoking means that someone will like you. So you'll be given all sorts of information by different people and all of those are normative beliefs. And it might be the government who are giving you information. They might like put a, a poster up saying quit smoking because it, it causes lung, lung damage or something. That's also a normative belief. So you can have all the normative beliefs, but whether you act on them is to do with the next section, your motivation to comply. So how motivated are you to comply with those different messages? So your friends say to you, um, why don't you, don't give up smoking because smoking is really cool, and you want to be friends with them, so therefore you are motivated to comply with their philosophy, their ideas. Whereas perhaps like a school teacher might say, you should quit smoking because it's really bad for you. But supposing you hate that school teacher and you're like, well, I don't care what you say, 
I hate you, I'm not going to listen to you. So your motivation, to, so you've got all the messages, some are true, some are not true, and it's dependent upon the person as to whether they're going to be motivated to comply with what each of those normative beliefs are telling you. So you mix together normative beliefs, motivation to comply, and those two things give you your subjective norms. Your own opinion based on what feels normal for you from what other people have told you and how much you respect what they say. Um, and the last section, the red section, not really the last, the last, the, the red section is your personal control beliefs. And it's made up of two things, self-efficacy beliefs and perceived external barriers. So we'll look at that first section, self-efficacy beliefs. Now I've never heard the word efficacy before I started learning about the theory of planned behaviour. But self-efficacy means your, like how confident you are that you can change even in the face of barriers. It's about your self-confidence in your own abilities. If you've got high self-efficacy beliefs, then you are confident that you can change anything you want in your life. So if we look at that in terms of smoking, um, someone with high self-efficacy would be like, yeah, of course I can give up smoking, it's dead easy, I can do this. Somebody with low self-efficacy beliefs is not going to be confident. They're going to say, I'm never going to give up smoking, I'm so addicted, I really like it, all my friends smoke, it's just part of my life. So they have no self-belief that they're going to be able to quit. So that's the first section. And the second red bit is called the perceived external barriers. And that means external factors that we perceive might prevent us achieving our goals. So they might be true, they might, no, might not be true. But it means things in your life which means you see it as a barrier to achieving that likelihood of behaviour. So in terms of giving up smoking, it might be that you perceive you might try and give up but the addiction overtakes you or that you might try and give up, but you're peer pressured by other people and that's a barrier. Or it might be that you, um, you feel like you need cigarettes because you're really stressed and it gets you through the day. Um, maybe you've got social anxiety and a cigarette will help you with your social anxiety. Then that, if you take the cigarettes away, you're left with the social anxiety. So you have lots of perceived external barriers. They're perceived by you, they're not necessarily true. If you didn't have any perceived external barriers, like you're like, yeah, I think I'm, you know, I've, um, to give up smoking would be easy. I mean, I'd save money, and no, no one, you know, everyone would be pleased for me. Then you've got no perceived external barriers. So the personal control beliefs, your personal control beliefs, comes from self-efficacy, how confident am I that I can do it, and your perceived external barriers. And the next, the last section now is the. Um, the really darker orange section, and it's called intention. So if you, if you intend to do something, then it's likely to happen. So your intention is made up of your personal attitude, that first yellow section, your subjective norms, the middle section, and your perceived control beliefs. All of those things go into intention. So if your personal attitude is that um, giving up smoking is really worthwhile for you and it's got tons of benefits, so you got a good personal attitude to it. Your subjective norms are that um, your friends have told you and your parents and your school teachers have said that smoking is, is bad for you and you believe them and you like them and you respect them. And if your personal control beliefs are also high, so you think, yeah, I can do anything, I do, my self-efficacy is high, I can do anything I want to do, I can give up smoking if I want, and you don't have any perceived external barriers then the intention is to give up smoking, and then that leads into the likelihood of behaviour that you are likely to give up smoking. So it's all positive. But it's not always as clear cut. Sometimes likelihood of behaviour can come directly from perceived external barriers. You can bypass the whole model, which seems a bit pointless to me, but you can do. So supposing you think, I'm so addicted, I can't give up, then that goes straight to likelihood of behaviour, and therefore you don't give up smoking. Or it could be that your personal attitudes, subjective norms and personal control beliefs are all a bit mixed up. So you want to give up smoking, your personal attitude is you want to, but maybe your subjective norms are that, well, your family and friends smoke so that you don't think you should. And your personal control beliefs are that you've tried to give up smoking, you, you, you'd like to give it a go, but you're not really sure. Then everything's a little bit confused and the likelihood of behaviour um, could go either way. 
So the theory of planned behaviour is all about looking at that likelihood of behaviour. And as far as health promotion goes, um, so I know that some BTEC students are looking at the Bottle Top project um, for their health promotion um, campaign. Uh, so if you want to have a look at the Bottle Top project, you just go to www.bottletop.info and you'll see on it a website that's been made by young people, for young people, all about alcohol. And it's got lots of messages. It's not judgmental. It's a brilliant website. It's just people who have ideas, like young people who have ideas about it, and they put those on the website. So if you're going to be creating something for that website, then supposing you came up with an idea to do with drink driving and you thought, right, well, I, drink driving is something that worries me and my friends, so I'm going to make a promotion campaign about that. You need to underpin it with some kind of psychological model so you could use the theory of planned behaviour. So your campaign might target a section like personal attitude. It might be that you make a campaign to try and get people to have a positive attitude to not drink driving. So the likelihood of behaviour is drink driving, and you're trying to stop people drink driving, not by being judgmental, but by being really clever and thinking, how can I give people a positive attitude to not drink drive? So you might target their outcome evaluation. How worthwhile is it for me not to drink drive? And you might, so you need to think about what could I do to change someone's personal attitude? Or it might be, what could I do to create someone's subjective norm? Because your personal, your health promotion campaign is going to be part, you, you are going to be part of their normative beliefs because you're giving them information. But how do you get them to motivate, be motivated to comply with your message? So your, your message is the normative belief. You are going to be giving them information about drink driving. How do you make it clever enough, interesting enough, relevant enough that they are going to be motivated to comply with your message? And that's the challenge for you in creating your health promotion campaign. So good luck with it. If you want even to get the past criteria, you've got to underpin your campaign with some kind of theory. So this is one theory you could use, some kind of model. Um, and if you want the distinction, you've got to kind of justify why you've done your campaign in the way you have. So if you can say, yeah, I use the subjective norms part of the um, the theory of planned behaviour to underpin my campaign and explain how and say I tried to get people to change their attitude by, the, by doing this and say how you did it then you're going to come out with a really good grade. So good luck and uh, speak to your teachers if you need any extra help.